Thank you, Nancy. Nancy stole it this morning. So. Very good. <laughs> welcome, everyone. Greetings. And also, for those that are joining us on Facebook, welcome to you this morning. Charles Burton, <clears throat> I'm Dave Beatty, in case you don't know who I am. Uh, several announcements. Today, at 10 15, we'll be meeting for a fourth session <clears throat> in the youth room to discuss issues concerning our church future. Our district superintendent, uh, Russ Abel, will be with us today, and everyone is, is encouraged to attend. It's important that we understand the issues that we're going to be talking about in the future. So if you haven't been there, uh, please, uh, please try to be there today, or at least next Sunday, if it's the last one. Very important. Three weeks from today, <clears throat> on September 11th, is Project 216 Day. On the worship service that day, followed by the box lunch. Then we meet the gym to pack lunches to support world hunger. Sign up sheets are in the fellowship hall. If you haven't uh, signed up already, uh, please consider doing so because we need a lot of volunteers for that very worthwhile project. There are other announcements in the newsletter. <coughs> Be sure and, and to get a copy of that if you don't get it online to keep up to date all the things going on here at the church. So we have Jeff and Rhonda back with us this morning, and uh, we welcome them after a well-deserved vacation. Hey, Dave, good morning. Good morning. Hey, it is so good to be back. I have to tell you, Alaska is beautiful. If you get a chance to go see it, you should check it out. But uh, we, and it was wonderful. I'm so glad we got to do that. But we do we miss you guys. We're so glad to be back. It's so good to be back with you. And as we were Friday night, as we got home at, at like 11.30 or whatever, and we were driving by the church to get home, and thought, ah, there it is. And it's so good to be back. Because I knew it all, the, the building not only represented what I happen to do for a living, but it represented all of you. And so we're so glad to be back and to be with you. Hey, we've got a lot to catch up on. A lot to do and a lot, to, a lot of ground to cover um, together, and we're going to get get right to it. Are you ready to go deeper into worship? Yeah. All right, let's do that. Let's have, let's stand and sing. Mm -hmm. It's not COVID, it's just a cold, but if I seem a little 
physically distant from you, that's why. <laughs> okay? So I really do mean it when I say we, we missed you, and it's so good to be back. But uh, there, there's so much to be grateful for. I know that we're dealing with a lot of contentious issues, and there, there's a lot of strife, and there's a lot of en enmity in, in the world today, and I, I get all that. But uh, the minute I, I, I feel overwhelmed by that, I start thinking about all the things that we have to be grateful for, all the, the blessings that we have. And it, it, I, I, I've said this before, it sounds kind of cliche, but it's so true, that if I just took a minute to write down all the blessings and the ways that I've been blessed, the ways that we've been blessed, we would run out of ink and paper long before we would be able to stop counting our blessings. Amen? Amen. So with that in mind, as we prepare to surrender our hearts for today and maybe forever to Jesus the Christ, let us prepare to do so with an attitude of gratitude. Let's pray. Well, good morning again, O oh Lord. It is so good to be in your house. It is so good to be following your son, Jesus. Not always easy, but good. It is amazing to me, O oh God, how when people want to imitate you, they so often try to imitate your power. But so seldom do we human beings try to imitate your humility. For you created the world and everything in it without a word. And yet, despite that power, despite that awesomeness, you invite us, created humanity, to be co-creators with you. Now that's humility. You can impose your will on us, but you don't. You ask us to join you where you are at work. So Lord, this morning we want to do two things. And then we do them always. But first of all, we want to be grateful for all that you've given us and all the ways that you've blessed us. We're grateful for the work of your fingers and the work of your hands. But we also pray for your guidance and a uh, way for us to be alert to where you're working in the world around us. And that we might hear the invitation you issue to us when you say, hey, come and join me. May we never ask again. Lord, what is your will for my life? Or in some ways, that's an irrelevant question. The better question is, Lord, what is your will? And when you show us what that will is, and you choose to invite us to become part of that process, help us to have the courage, the conviction, and the energy to say yes and do it. For when we do, the world becomes dramatically better. For that, we are grateful. And to put the exclamation point on the request and the prayer, we pray as Jesus once taught his disciples so long ago, as together as the people of God, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So, Gary Larson. Now, if you've been around for a long time like I have, that, that name might make you smile. But for those of you that don't know who Gary Larson is, Gary Larson is a cartoonist, and he, he, he penned a, a famous cartoon called The Far Side. And you might know what The Far Side is. You may have seen some of their the, uh, the cartoons of The Far Side. And to, the, to this day, Gary Larson's uh, books and, and his, his cartoons are, are quite popular. They're very popular uh, birthday presents, Christmas presents, that kind of thing, calendars. You know, I, for a stretch there, I had a, a 
far side cartoon calendar every year. And I just find his, his content so remarkably funny. Right? Gary Larson has a very unique way of looking at the world, a very humorous and unique way. Some would say a warped way of looking at the world. Maybe that's why your pastor likes him so much, because <laughs> my sense of humor has been defined as warped on more than one occasion. But I'd like to share with you some of my personal favorite Far Side cartoons. So there's one coming up, and you'll see it on the screen now. For those of you watching on Facebook, we really can't share the cartoons with you, but I'll try to describe them. So the first one is this one. And it shows a, uh, it'll come up on the screen in a minute, but it shows a kid, and he's, he's at the door of a school, and as he's preparing to get into the door, the door above the sign says, Sunnyvale School for the Gifted. Right? So you already get the idea this is a pretty prestigious place. And he's trying to push the door open, and then to the other side of the door, there's a sign that says, Pull. Right? <laughs> love that cartoon. I love it because it suggests something to me. It suggests that, you know, it's never, no matter what you have going on for you, no matter what kind of gifts and graces you might be experiencing and, and, and the beneficiary of, it's never a good idea to take yourself too seriously. And I just love that cartoon. The, the next cartoon that apparently I'm not going to be able to share with you, unfortunately, but uh, the next cartoon, I'll try to describe it to you. Uh, you see that, that you're in the, the living room of this family, and there's this couple, and the, one, the husband has this shotgun, and the wife is, she is perplexed. And just to the front of the cartoon, you see these two pairs of feet where the, the people have fallen backwards, and the feet are up like this. And uh, there's coffee on the coffee table. And he's got this shotgun, and you can tell from the smoking barrel it's just been fired, right? And so the wife says, the caption, that says to Carl, from now on, you only get decapitated coffee. <laughs> I like that cartoon, too. Because, and don't, don't misunderstand. It's never a good idea to dispose of your neighbors with a shotgun. So I'm not trying to lift that up as something to be glorified. But who of us has not been so amped up or stressed out by life that we've been uh, frustrated to the point of distraction? Again, I think that that cartoon speaks to that issue for me, right? So uh, that, that's another reason that that cartoon is funny. The, the, the last one I want to share with you is, if you can envision this, if you can envision a, a lab and two scientists are working in the lab, and in the front of the cartoon is a picture of a missile, uh, is a missile, and it's, it's clear that it is a nuclear missile, and one of the scientists is, is working on this mis missile quite intently, and then there's another scientist right behind him with a, a blown up paper bag, and you can tell he's getting ready to pop the bag, right? You know, and so clearly he's going to just, just scare the pants off his colleagues. Now, the reason I, I remember this one, uh, well, I thought of this one um, before we left, but then got kind of the exclamation point on it while we were in Alaska. We met uh, these two couples. The husbands were twin, twin brothers, and they were both aeronautical engineers who worked at, at, at the Department of Defense in Utah at a federal plant, and they worked on stuff just like this. So I, I asked Gary and Greg, you know, okay, so here's this far side cartoon. Does stuff like that really happen? And they just kind of both grin and go, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's the reason I like the far side. Because you see, there's so much about humor, and you heard me say this before, there's so much about humor that is um, rooted in the truth, and that's why it's funny. There's an element of truth to the best humor that draw, calls our attention, uh, attention to a, a more powerful truth, right? For example, the very first cartoon I shared with you, Sunny Bell School for the Gifted, um, it, it's a reminder to me in, in any way to, to never take myself too seriously. You know, you just set yourself up for all kinds of, of trouble when you do. So the best humor is often rooted in the truth, and I think there's so much to that. Today, you're going to hear a scripture story uh, that about two disciples, and they are taking themselves very seriously. And they make this presumptuous request. Actually, they, they, they get their mom to make this presumptuous request of Jesus on their behalf. And I, I don't know if Jesus would have been amused by Gary Larson's The Far Side, but I sure am. And I think the story that you're about to hear could be worthy of a far side moment when you take a 30,000 foot view of it and 
you see this story, you see the nature of the request, you see how Jesus responds to it, and it, it's almost like it's, they, they miss the point so, by such a wide mark that it's almost funny. But Jesus' response is quite serious. Are you ready to hear about it? Let's do it. From Matthew 20, Jesus teaches about serving others. Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She now prospected to ask a favor. What is your request, he asked. She replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus answered by saying to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Oh yes, they replied, we are able. Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup, but I have no right to ask to say who will sit on my right or my left. My father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. But Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and the officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be the first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to save, not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen to that. Thank you, David. So I'd like to share just one more far side cartoon with you. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not there, but if you can picture a beach. And you can picture this whale that's been beached. And you know, the beach whale's in trouble, right? So there's this beach whale, and you can see these tiny little dots on the top of it. And the caption, the caption reads, let me just be sure. The caption uh, of this cartoon says, the first fly on the beach whale. You see all these dozens of little dots on top of the, the, the whale. And one little dot lands on the whale, and the, the conversation bubble above that particular fly says, dibs. Right? So the fly, the first fly that lands on the beach whale, this massive beach whale, this tiny little fly, the fly lands on the beach whale and says, Dibs, meaning it's all mine, right? Yeah? So, and it's just hysterical because you look at it and you think, okay, that, that fly, if he had a thousand lifetimes and then the, the, the whale would stay preserved enough to, to eat it, we, we could not possibly consume that whale in, in all the lifetimes that God could possibly. Even if he invited his buddies to come and land and share with him, all those flies could not possibly do that in the time they, they had left. So, kind of an interesting proposition, right? Now, the reason I think that's so funny is because so many times we make all these outrageous assumptions about what we could do, and we have no clue about what it is, the task before us. Again, I have, I have no idea whether Jesus would have thought that Gary Larson's work was funny or not. It's certainly funny to me. But there's something quite deadly serious about what, what's going on with James and John. Uh, they, they approach Jesus. Actually, they don't. They, 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 their mother does. The, the Mrs. Zebedee comes to Jesus and says, hey, listen, could you, could you give my sons these positions when you come into your kingdom? Now, that's the way the text reads, so you can kind of visualize it, but you also get the impression that James and John are there, and what they don't say is more powerful than what they do say. They don't say anything, right? So presumably, their mother is acting with their full encouragement, because neither one of them steps up and says, oh, Mom, come down, you're embarrassing me, right? And we were with our, our grandchildren and our, our son and daughter-in-law Friday night as we were getting ready to come home. We kept our car parked there, and, and there was what, this exchange between my, my son and my grandson that was amusing. I'm sure it's played itself out many, many times, but uh, our son Nick was kind of preparing uh, Harrison's meal, and Harrison says, don't touch my stuff. I can do it my 
myself, you know, I mean, you, you get that, right? And, and Harrison has no clue that, you know, this is a labor of love of his daddy that he's been doing for years and years. He's just not catching on to the fact that, oh, okay, you know, you're old enough to do it yourself. You know, we, we have all of these notions of what we can or can't do. And we really have no clue about what it is that we're asking. So James and John don't say, hey, mom, you know, you're, you're really out of line here. Don't ask Jesus that. They stay silent, assuming that you know, we, we kind of like to have those, those positions. So his mom, their mom, asked Jesus, hey, when, when you come into your kingdom, could my sons have signature right in your left hand? That's a really colorful way of saying, could they have positions of power and authority when you come into your kingdom? It's a little bit like if <clears throat> Jesus were a political candidate and he wins the, the, the object of his candidacy, say the presidency of the United States, for example. It's, it's a little bit as if the, the, trans, this, the campaign team has come into power and it's like one of the campaign managers say to the candidate, hey, listen, could, could my one son be your secretary of state? Could my other son be your chief of staff? Right? That's a, it's a little bit of the nature of the request. So Jesus basically, he responds so beautifully. He, he basically says, are you sure you want to ask that? Are you really sure you want to go down that road? <clears throat> because first of all, Jesus tells them two things, two really important things. He says to her, well, in the first place, those jobs aren't mine to dole out. Those jobs belong to another, to a point. It's not my place. And then he says the second thing, which is even more sobering. He says, and, and even if you get the job, do you really, really want it? Now, I know a little bit about what secretaries of state do. I know a little bit about what chief of staffs do. Um, and it is almost a humanly impossible job. But it is doable. I mean, people have been doing those jobs with varying degrees of success for hundreds of years, but it is a human job. What Jesus is suggesting is that you don't even know what you're asking. You don't know what you're asking for. See, the, the, I think that the disciples are looking at this coming kingdom of God in a light that's not quite accurate. And, and to be fair to them, what frame of reference do they have? And this is, the way God is working in, in the midst of this is pretty unique. So while the disciples, all, all of them, are thinking about what's to come in a certain way, Jesus is looking at it in a dramatically different way. And, and we've got to compare and contrast those two ways. So the disciples are thinking, yeah, the kingdom of God is coming. We're grateful for that. That's been predicted for a long time. And and we're excited about the possibility that it's coming. And they're thinking about the Romans. They're thinking about getting the Romans off their back so that, that, that they're no longer oppressive and they no longer enslave them. They're thinking about the religious elite in, in their own country that are, are, are so out of touch and maybe bringing them to repentance. And they're thinking about all these things about maybe a hundred years past and a hundred years into the future. Their, their view of what the kingdom of God is extremely narrow and extremely limited. Now, what Jesus is thinking is something quite different. And he's thinking about the people who are yet to be born and the people who have been born centuries ago. He's thinking about the alive. He's thinking about the dead. He's thinking about the, all kinds of things. He's thinking about eternity. What Jesus is thinking about is, to, to put it in a nutshell, what Jesus is thinking about is how do we, the whole, how does the Trinity, this Holy Spirit, God, Father, and me, how do we get created humanity back into the garden? The disciples are thinking about power. Jesus is thinking about the rupture of sin and how to overcome it. Jesus is thinking, how do we get people back into the garden of God's perfection? The disciples are thinking about power. And Jesus is thinking about Genesis 3. That's really the key difference. So, they make this 
this outrageous request, and Jesus sets him straight. Are you really sure you want to want to do that? <clears throat> so, while James and John are trying to picture themselves in a position in the coming kingdom of God, um, they, they, they were using their wildest imaginations. But Jesus was thinking about something far more real. He was thinking about what a world could look like without sin. Can you imagine that? I mean, try to apply your wildest imagination to that. What would a world without sin look like? It would probably be a world that, where there is no more strife. There is no more bitterness. There is no more drama. There's no hidden agendas. It's a world with no fear. It's a world with no pain. It's a world with no regrets. It's a world without racism. Can you picture that? It's a world that... And because we originally intended, we were originally intended to be far more spiritual beings than physical ones, it would be a world where same-sex attraction is no longer an issue one way or the other. Because we are spiritual beings far more than we are physical ones. And the only reason that we're physical beings is because God wanted us to perpetuate the species. All of those things would be off. That's what Jesus has in mind when he's talking about the kingdom of God. The disciples are thinking about something quite different. Let's be honest about what James and John were up to. The Zebedee boys and their mom were making a power grab. Let's just be honest about that. Jesus, in his mind, was seeing what is really going on around James and John and Mrs. Zebedee. He was, he was thinking about what it was like to get his disciples and their mom back into the garden. Friends. With that presumptuous request made some 2,000 years ago, Jesus was thinking about how to get you and me back into the garden. Not just James and John and their mom and the other, other ten disciples, but all of us. And that's what the kingdom of God is really all about. As I imagine it, John and James are thinking about the eminently practical things that, uh, that, that they had their mama make this request on their behalf. They were likely thinking about how to get the Romans off their backs. They were thinking about all these things that are in the immediate now. Jesus had an eternal perspective. So, what does that mean for us? Well, I think the first thing it means is that Christianity following Jesus is countercultural. Because the culture all around us is, is about the culture. It's about certain things. It's about certain things that they see as norms. And that's not what Christianity is about. It, it, it really amazes me, as I said in my prayer earlier, how when we human beings, we want to imitate God. We want to imitate the power of God. But how rarely do we human beings choose to imitate the humility of God? And we don't want any part of that. Right? We don't want to do that because that is hard. That's something that he did, that, that God did, that was just kind of amazing. It was kind of mind-blowing that, that God would do that. You know, <clears throat> Jesus shows James and John and Mom what it is to be a a follower of God. In his response, he says two things. One, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. You heard, you heard David just read that, right? Jesus also made it clear that the same attitude is expected of those who would follow him. That's certainly a direct response to the outrageous request that, that the Zebedee boys and their mom made, but it's also a response to us to this day. If you're going to follow me, you're going to serve. The other expectation that Jesus lays out in his response is this one. He says, uh, you say you want to follow me, but do you want to be like me? And you follow me all you want, but are you willing to be like me in the following of me? Now, I want you to really think about that question. Because it doesn't just apply to those 12 disciples so long ago and the moms of the disciples, whoever else was within earshot. 
But it was a question aimed directly at us across the centuries as well. So when you call yourself Christian, you say, I want to follow Jesus. Okay, that's great. It's good. I think probably just about everybody in here would say that that's true. We want to follow Jesus. But here's the second half of the question. And I want you to really pray about this because it's, it's a huge part of the question. Following Jesus is one thing. Being like Jesus is quite another thing. You want to follow Jesus? Great. Are you willing to be like Jesus? You say you want to follow me. You say you want to be like me. Well, then put on an apron and go serve the hungry and the homeless. Don't just write the checks. You say you want to follow me. You say you want to be like me. Well, then volunteer in a nursing home and, and simply sit with folks who think that they've been forgotten and that they've been left behind. Go and visit with them and bring a little joy into their life. You say you want to follow me. You say you want to be like me. Well, then pick up a hammer and go to the nearest Habitat for Humanity building and physically get involved with, with making a home for the working poor so that they can live with dignity and honor. You say you want to follow me. You say you want to be like me. Well, great. Then go to the local high school and become a mentor for some young person that feels like they've been one of the ones that have been left behind. Be a mentor for one of some junior high school kid that's trying to figure it all out and feels so awkward and so socially uh, out of it. Just be with them and let them know that in the eyes of God, you are precious and adored. Go to the local elementary school because even there you've got some kids that feel like they're worthless and they're, they're valueless. And you can become the mentor that tells them that, no, you're not junk. Because God doesn't think you're junk and God doesn't make junk. You say you want to follow me. You say you want to be like me. And pick up the cross. That's a tough message, isn't it? Pick up the cross. That's a stark message. And who wants to do that? I don't want to do that. Do you really want to pick up the cross? Because when you say, yeah, I'll do that, what you're saying is I'm willing to, to suffer like Jesus suffered. I'm willing to endure for something better, like Jesus endured. That's not exactly a popular message, is it? That's not a message that, 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 that a church, church growth expert would probably say, yeah, that's going to put, put, uh, put behinds in your seats in your church. It's going to grow your attendance. It's going to make things work. Hey, you want to go down and play that one? Well, I, I have a, a counterintuitive thought on that. You know, in 1968, when the United Methodist Church came into being, it was there's so much promise and so much potential. And, but you know, every single year since then, attendance in the United Methodist Church has declined. In over 50 years, every single year, attendance has declined. And I don't think that's unique. In fact, I know that's not unique to us as Methodists. Every mainline denomination is experiencing that same decline. Well, I, I want to suggest to you that the reason for that decline isn't that this message is so stark? I want to suggest to you that the decline is that the message has not been faithfully portrayed. And that too many clergy like me preach a feel good religion rather than the truth of the gospel. And it might feel good following Jesus, but Christianity is not a feel good religion. It's really not. And I think that's where it comes into play, that it's, it is counter-cultural. Because our culture is all about comfort and self-actualization and all of those things. Amen? Amen? But Christianity isn't that. In fact, Christianity calls us to put all that aside and be willing to literally suffer for Jesus. Are you willing to do that? Let's talk about Chief Grace. And there's a great commentary on 
cheap grace. What, what does he mean by cheap grace? Well, we all want to experience the grace of God, amen? We want to experience the grace of God, and yes, we do. And thank you, Jesus, amen? But when Bonhoeffer talks about cheap grace, he's saying we want the grace of God, but only if it doesn't cost us anything. We want to experience the, the forgiveness of God, but we don't want to repent. Friends, that is cheap grace. And I'm just going to tell you, cheap grace is ineffective grace. It doesn't take for very long. Grace is costly. Discipleship is costly. It will cost you something. I'm not, not sure that, that James and John understood that, but they came to understand it. They certainly came to. In Acts 2.12, 12, we see that, that James is beheaded by Herod Agrippa because he followed Jesus. And he was willing to suffer to do that. He got the message eventually. And while John wasn't martyred in the same way, we, we see great ample evidence that he suffered greatly on the, the cause for the cause of Jesus, right? So they did get it finally. They did finally understand it. John Wesley once said, I have no fear that a people called Methodists will cease to exist. But I fear greatly that they will embrace the form of religion and forsake its power. Now, think, think about what that means. And to, to me, what Wesley's trying to say is that you know, you're going to call yourself a follower of Jesus, and that's, that's great. But you turn your back on the power power of God when you rest in your own self-sufficiency and you don't embrace the power of the living God. <laughs> right about now I'm kind of wondering what you're thinking about your pastor. So I'm saying, pastor Chuck got kind of feisty while he was in Alaska, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> well, the truth is I've got a lot of time to think. That's one of the things that the, the, the unintended gift of that vacation has given me. I, I promised Rhonda when we went that I wouldn't think about work and that I certainly wouldn't listen to any of the news and all that. I was pretty much faithful about that. But it also let me think about things from a, a bigger perspective. Christianity is so countercultural. And I think your spider sense should start tingling, your, your, your radar ought to ping. When you see our faith being presented in a way that fits neatly into your culture. You need to look at that with a, a huge degree of skepticism. And you need to do a lot of prayer. If the message of Jesus is palatable in a culture, it could be that the culture gets it. And that's great. But it's far more likely that if the message of Jesus is palatable in the culture, it's because the message of Jesus has been watered down. And I assure you, a watered down Jesus doesn't do anybody any good. So don't let that happen. You say you want to be like me. Say you want to follow me. Make sure you understand what that means. So to close, <clears throat> I go back to that image of <clears throat> Gary Larson on the far side, the, the beach whale and the flies calling dibs. And, and if the fly gets it, what does that mean? The question is, how do I eat this whale? This whale that represents thousands and thousands of years of human sin. Centuries upon centuries of human broken, brokenness and hatred and strife and enmity. How do I eat this so that it goes away? How do I do that? How do we get past the, the barriers, the, the bondage of our fallenness and our brokenness? How do we, how do we, the, the tiny little fly that each of us are as individual humans, how do we, how do we overcome that? Two things. Why don't we do it with Jesus' help? And then we eat that whale one bite at a time. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'd like to 
everybody now to stand and let us sing together. Optional. 
I'm going to say that again. Be really clear to this. Because a watered down Jesus doesn't do anybody any good. Following Jesus, if you choose to pick up the cross and do that, you will experience some suffering. But while suffering is inevitable, misery is an optional. Don't choose misery. You don't have to. Because Jesus is not watered down. And no matter what, whatever shame that you may have experienced, I assure you that the blood of the Lamb has taken it away. So just remember that. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his confidence towards you and give you peace.